Welcome to the Memorial Art Gallery. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jessica Martin, and I am curator in charge, curator of American art here at MAG. Uh, just to get us started, I would like to thank MAG's Academic Programs Department for hosting today's event. In particular, Dr. Niall Blunt, the McPherson Director of Academic Programs, and Chio Uyama, who manages public programs for Dr. Blunt's department. I'd also like to thank the MAG team, the world-class MAG team, who brought the Lions, the Joan Lyons exhibition to the museum, including Almudena Escobar Lopez, Jonathan Binstock, Courtney DiMartino, Adam Rands, Travis Johansson, and Robert Stressler. So I am so pleased and honored to introduce Joan Lyons to the stage today. For more than six decades, Joan has been making pictures that challenge the authority of the traditional photographic image. She has exhibited her art in galleries and museums around the world with work in collections including the De Cordova Museum, J. Paul Getty Museum, Museum of Fine Arts Houston, MoMA, Minneapolis Institute of Art, National Gallery of Canada, the Yale University Art Gallery, not to mention the Memorial Art Gallery of the University of Rochester. In addition to her work in photography, Joan Lyons was founding director of the Visual Studies Workshop Press, which she led from 1972 to 2004. There, she was responsible for the production and publication of 450 titles, as well as over 30 editions of her own artist's books. She's the editor of the Influential Artist Books, a critical anthology and source book, as well as Artist Books, Visual Studies Workshop Press, 1972 to 2008. Please help me welcome to the stage, Joan Lyons. Well, thank you everyone for coming. This is a wonderful collection of friends, strangers. Love to see you all. And thank you so much, Jess. It's really been a pleasure to work with Jess and uh, the team at MAG. Uh, they've done, I think, a spectacular job of hanging the work. I'm seeing it in a whole uh, new context, uh, so uh, beautifully displayed. So I'm thrilled with that. Thank you. What I'm going to do is just not say anything much and, and run through uh, the uh, slides, which are essentially, it's essentially the work in the show arranged chronologically, because I know that some of you uh, have not had a chance to go through the exhibition, which, uh, by the way, is spread out throughout the museum. There are pieces kind of a little far afield, so it's like a little scavenger hunt. Uh, <laughs> anyhow. Uh, I'll just do this.
Uh, this work is not in this exhibition. It is currently in an exhibition at uh, More Fire Glass Studio. That's it. Well, it's wonderful to be here today. Um, I was joking with Joan, we have two introverts talking. Uh, they, they may not have that uh, much to say in length. Um, and we have really brilliant people in the audience. So I want to make sure that there's time for some other uh, questions. Uh, to be discussed um, as, as we get into this. First, just to start in terms of gathering and the thinking about gathering of work um, and the gathering of people. I mean, it's been a, a, a tumultuous few years, obviously. So the gathering of work and coming to a space um, and how all that has, has transpired is, is a good place to, to begin. Um, and also thinking about that as a as relationship to the human experience, um, which is re you know, really important both in Joan's work and and um, and, and being here together as an audience um, together. Uh, so my personal relationship to Joan and this work was that I, I came here 20 years ago, uh, partly as a result of her work in publishing, uh, the artist books anthology of essays uh, about um, books as artworks and publications uh, found me in Missouri in the 90s and 
um, in a library, and then I eventually made my way to be Joan's student. So I was a graduate student in Joan's very last cohort at Visual Studies Workshop, came to study books. Um, and I want to start with this, uh, this statement that, uh, that I found on Joan's bookshelf. Uh, Joan had a, uh, had a press office that all the graduate students could um, access, and late at night we would be... Sure, yeah. Thanks. Turn the volume up and introduce myself. Yes. My name is Tate Shaw. Uh, I am the editor of uh, Visual Studies Workshop Press um, post Joan, and I uh, work at Visual Studies Workshop, and I also work at um, SUNY Brockport as an associate professor uh, in, that, in that realm. My apologies. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I'll continue to speak a little louder as we get into this. So um, as I was a graduate student with, with Joan, we would have access to some of her um, books. And I would go into her office late at night, in the middle of the night, and read all the books on, book shelf, on Joan's shelf, uh, particularly to learn more about her work, but learn about the books that she had published. And in one of them, I found a, a statement that Joan had written about her own work in 1982, and I, I stole it. Uh, and I, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure why, I just, I needed it at that moment, and I have revisited it for several times over the uh, course of my uh, past 20 years here. And so I'm gonna read that now, um, and well, that'll help us get started. You know, so. um, and this is broken up into uh, almost like epithets and, and, and lines. We talked a little bit about uh, her writing before this, and, and uh, Joan is a bit of a, a hewer, uh, more of an editor. Um, so may write, but then kind of boil it down to, to essences. Um, here we go. Work is about process. The shape it takes gives evidence of process. The process of forming the work, the process of forming the worker are inseparable. I work with what is available, a variety of optical devices. I work through complexity to something simple and direct. This distillation process becomes more evident as time goes on. I work at those things that are evident, how I see, not conventions of seeing, what visual recording is about, how systems shape data. It is organic and about growth. That is from 1982. Hmm. <laughs> I wonder, uh, we can start, how, how do you, how do you uh, when you hear that now, is that still uh, how you think about your work in terms of process and uh, in relation to you know, the work changing you in, in, yeah, yeah, in, the, in the meaning? Yeah, that was not bad. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know there, there is always this question of, you know, process and idea. Uh, and... Uh, you know, I think that that all, always informs, you know, what you do, and those things kind of come together. So, you know, I'd like to say for the start, when people look at my work, they say, oh, you know, what a bunch of tricky, interesting, obscure photographic processes uh, use. But, uh, you know, I guess I never really thought about that because I was, I was primarily a printer. I mean, I started as a painter and a, a print printmaker, and then I had a print shop, and I had the Visual Studies Workshop, which was and remains this amazing uh, uh, center for visual artists. So uh, there were always a lot of ideas floating around, and there was always a lot of equipment floating around, because the workshop's collections are famously uh, built by what falls in the door. <laughs> and uh, we had lots of obsolete equipment. We had lots of outdated paper we had. And so, uh, you know, some piece of equipment or box of paper that didn't cost anything would appear and say, okay, you know, what can I do with this? And you put it in the back of your head. And, and then an idea might form conceptually about, you know, some interest in something you wanted to do. And then, you know, just gradually those things would come together, you know, until you found the right uh, you know, content for a process or the right process for a content, if that doesn't sound too convoluted. But I think I said it better. <laughs> uh, could, could you talk about some of the, um, especially in the uh, earliest stages of, of working with that available means, like what, what are some of the processes that um, shaped, shaped your original thinking about photography? Because 
it is quite unique in the sense that it's uh, you do have all these photographers that are coming through, and this is you know a, a sort of enviable photo town with right. a lot of people coming and going, uh, and you were in the center of that mm -hmm. coming and going. Yeah. But you took a completely askew approach, in a sense, from a lot of the people who were yeah. passing through. Yeah, well, you know, I really had uh, no background in photography and no training in photography. Uh, my husband, Nathan, before he started Visual Studies Workshop, was uh, a curator of photography and associate director of the Eastman House in the 60s, which was a very formative time. And, and so, you know, our house was like full of photographers and full of people talking about photography. So a lot of the, you know, ideas of thinking about photography rubbed off on me, but, you know, I wasn't a photographer. I was, you know, I, I didn't do any photographic work at the time. And, uh, you know, so the idea of doing finished work with a 35 millimeter camera, I don't think ever really occurred to me. I used that kind of device to maybe document other work. And besides, I wasn't going to compete with all these amazing people, print makers. You know. uh, so photography sort of crept into my work. Uh, I did a lot of things like rubbings and stencils and, and liked uh, indirect way of making an image, uh, you know, some, some screen printing, other kinds of things. Uh, so at the beginning, sticking little pieces of photographic content in to a drawing seemed a natural process. And then, you know, it went from there. Uh, you know, and then later, you know, when I became a printer, okay, so I, I had a 20 by 24 graphic arts camera. And because I was a printer, I thought 20 by 24 was a fine negative size. <laughs> It, it was a lot more natural to me than 35 millimeters. So, you know, obviously it's going to occur to me at one time or other that, uh, that I can use this camera that usually you use for reproducing photographs to prepare them for offset printing, uh, could be used as an actual camera and, and could be used to photograph an object. So. You know, it was just that kind of thinking. Actually, which is as much looking for shortcuts and easy ways to do things as anything else. I mean, it's, yeah. That, that was uh, one of the things I wanted to, to draw out in the work is, um, in essence, there's a remarkable informality to the work in that it's also um, extraordinarily complex and uh, and very, you know, very serious. And, and oftentimes, uh, though some humor creeps in um, here and there, but um, in terms of that ease and uh, the sense of informality, I, even like the symmetrical drawings that are showing now at, at Morfire, uh, I, and th things that you might think, or, or quilting patterns, for example, th things that you might uh -huh. think of as having a sort of formality or a decorative process uh, that would that would um, you know, hold down the work. These things become um, useful as uh, a means to some other end. I wonder if you could talk about you know, simplicity and, and, and how that kind of factors into to your thinking and your work. Well, you know, I kind of work intuitively and I, maybe I'm a little impatient, so <laughs> I'm not, but uh, okay, so I, I've always been interested in fabric. I've been sewing, you know, I, I started sewing clothing when I was 10 or so and uh, so fabric was always something that was around and was important and, and I liked. And in the 60s, a lot of my paintings, uh, which I don't have any longer, or records of them, had fabric collage. I would put a, stick a piece of fabric, um, you know, in a painting. So, uh, so, so the idea of, uh, of, of making fabric images using fabric or in the case of the symmetrical drawings, exploring the idea of pattern. And uh, then, you know, in the 70s, we were really thinking, uh, women were forming collectives to think about what kind of work they might do, uh, what feminism might mean. I was not lucky enough to have a community of women doing that, but I later found out there were those of us all over the country kind of spontaneously doing the same work, sort of uh, just discovering and uh, starting to explore 
you know, what a feminist practice might be, even though we had no idea. So, uh, so these ideas about, you know, the decorative arts, which was very separate from fine art. Decorative art was a lesser art. Things like uh, patterns and cloth and quilting and, uh, you know, wallpaper, book design. Uh, I mean, I started the symmetrical drawings because I was so interested in books and I wanted to find, I wanted to find a way to do book borders and, and then it kind of got past that. It went somewhere else. You know, so there was that interest in, in exploring, uh, you know, ideas about uh, women. You know, what, what would happen if we have all these, you know, and also, you know, art his, all art making comes out of art. You know, artists are looking at, you're always looking at the past and you're looking at history and you're looking at things that were done and you're feeding off that and responding to it in a way. So, so most of the images of women we have, obviously, coming down to us were made by men. And so you want to see, well, what happens if, if I do a series of women's portraits? Uh, are they going to be any different? And what if I, you know, use kind of archetypes? You, you know, kinds. I, w I was interested in, in that kind of idea too uh, at the time. So, so it was just kind of, I, I don't know, playing with things that are around in the atmosphere, I guess. How much of that was uh, relative to your, your work experience in the sense that you were um, do, doing a lot? You're not the kind of artist that was in the studio all day, every day. Um, you, you were, uh, you know, managing a press and teaching and you know, obviously a family. And um, what was your time like and, and how, how does that factor into um, some of the, the processes and the available means and yeah. other materials that you were working with? Yeah, uh, well, you know, I, I had to work in the time I could find to work because actually, as you said, there was a lot else going on and I never had the luxury of a full-time studio process, practice, but, you know, maybe I wouldn't have known what to do with that. So, you know, ideas sort of ferment and generate, and then when you have time to work, uh, you know, you bring it together kind of quickly and intensively, I guess. Hmm. Although a lot of that, a lot of that printmaking work was not quick. <laughs> no, <laughs> it yeah. Was, it was yeah. pretty laborious. You know, and I, li I like that about photography. I like that about the way I use photography because you think of a photograph as being, you know, instantaneous, you know, capturing a moment. And any of the, most of the photographic work I did was not like that. It might take, you know, a, a full day to put an image together that, you know, looked like one thing. And so I like that. When you talk about being a printer, um, could you talk a little bit about Im impression and, and you know and, and rubbing and how that starts to factor in? You, you mentioned it earlier. Um, I, I remember especially um, you focusing a lot, even in the early 2000s, on trying to get uh, good impressions on plain paper as opposed to oh. photographic substrates and and, and working through. Um, you know, ideas of impression in, in all different means. I mean, you worked uh, from, you know, relief printing all the way through to, you know, running your own, literally running an offset press at times. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I did a lot of printing. But I, it, it wasn't impressions as much. I think that I, I was sort of fascinated with the idea of getting a photographic image on plain paper, which now, of course, everybody does who has a computer. But uh, in the 70s and 80s, you know, and even 90s, this was a next to impossible thing. You had lots of very difficult, elaborate ways of doing it, uh, from, you know, cyanotype, which was the easiest, to, uh, you know, some of the work in the show are, are offset lithographs, and you had to prepare, you know, many negatives and many plates and many printings. Uh, but, but I like that idea. Because, as I said, you know, I basically, you know, was 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 a painter and somebody who drew a lot, and I, I love the feel of plain paper. So, like in the in the uh, women's portrait series, which is here, uh, you know, I love the idea of having a photographic image that's uh, carbon based, 
you know, like a drawing uh, on paper, but having it photographic. So it, it was more, you know, and the idea of the flattening, you know, I mean, everything is very flat. I just love the idea of, of converting whatever, you know, and smashing it against that picture plane. And, 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 you know, we're just very emphatically saying, you know, this is a piece of paper with an image on it. Could you move to some of those women's drawings and uh, uh, women's images so we could see what uh, you're referring to exactly? Yeah, these? These, yeah. Are you literally uh, working into them with, with the hand or are these? Uh, uh, some of them. Some of them, yeah. yeah. You know, but some of these, you know, like this one probably... You know, I was probably thinking of Julia Margaret Cameron, maybe, mm -hmm. or, or that 19th century, uh, you know, woman issue, or... And you mentioned uh, <laughs> Matisse, uh, a reference in this particular piece, or... Yeah, I have a little odalisk up there. But she's a sort of raunchy odalisk. <laughs> this one isn't... You know, this one maybe. Uh, you know, is the malevolent mother image from myth. You know, not, not that, not not that specific, but uh, but I was trying to work around. You know, uh, and not specifically through a history of representation. And and a lot of these, I mean, they are in a sense self portraits and. Uh, that's for a number of reasons. Uh, I, I wasn't interested in them as, you know, particularly self-portraits, but because I had a studio practice, I worked best without anyone else in the studio and who was available. And it was also a pretty long, laborious process. It might take a day to make one of these and it wasn't that comfortable. So occasionally I would enlist my reluctant daughter. <laughs> or the first image was my mother. But uh, generally speaking, you know, I, I use myself. You know, this has a lot of drawing, like the hair is drawn in. <laughs> so, so these are pieced together. You know, they look like single images, but they're really anywhere for, you know, half a dozen or more pieces that have been transferred to a large piece of paper from a small machine. You know, and then, then, you know, then this last series, these were toward the end, and there were a whole series of these. This is the only one uh, I have left uh, that I call Drawing from the Hip. So after about 10 years of making these images, I think the woman finally got some agency, and she became uh, someone who is a maker rather than someone who is observed. When you're working through those... Um you know, processes that become ideas. Are you consciously thinking about, you know, critique about um, the Western canon as you're developing those? Um, are, the, are you more, like you say, intuitive and in responding uh, in, in, in the work? It, you seem like, yeah. I've always thought of you as a critic and, and, and as well yeah. through, through yeah. making and yeah. through well, editing. Obviously, but. you know, I was just talking about that, you know, there are definite, you know, you know, ideas that, you know, come in there. Yeah. And yeah, you know, and the, you know the the history of you know the Western canon and the whole the idea of representation that comes down to us is just you know endless, endlessly fascinating. Why do we? Why did people ever make the images they make? You know, in the way they did, and uh, you know, and within the systems you know that they worked. You know. Could you talk a little bit about the media uh, narrative and landscapes that kind of come through the work where? Uh, particularly, like um, the, probably the most recent series of of that would be um, heavily included as rep representations, uh, where you're focusing largely on the uh, the Western canon and the landscapes thing. Uh, no, the uh, the, the representations. representations piece. They showed. I think it showed here in. Yeah. What, well, I don't have it here, so uh, you know people aren't seeing it. I don't know how much I want okay. to talk about it, but. Uh, this was a series, I think there was a show here in 2000, and it was like 85 badly uh, photographed <laughs> images from museums around the world. So it was like a, a viewer's eye view of, you know, pieces of artifacts of paintings, some of them famous, some not so. But, uh, but they're all juxtaposed, and I was interested in, in, in this piece specifically, 
but you know, in my work, in uh, you know, what people were looking at, how they were making work, how certain uh, certain myths uh, and themes came down through the centuries, uh, so that uh, you know, images of uh, martyred saints. Uh, are, are connected with, uh, you know, maybe the, the Charcot images of hysterical women or, or the 80s uh, uh, advertising images of heroin chic, you know, the emaciated model who's in an agonizing pose. So, so those things, you know, that one very specifically, you know, dealt with, with those kind of ideas. It's the same with the, uh, obviously the gynecologist with uh, representation of, of female body mm -hmm. through, um, the female reproduction system through, you know, millennia of men in, in that case. Mm -hmm. um, but also the, the backyard uh, piece yeah. with the, how those, those uh, newspaper imagery uh, right. in, integrates with the work and how you... See where is it? Yeah, you know, like th this series, this landscape thing, I mean, th this is sort of very easy to... Uh, so, so it really relates to, you know, the 19th century concept of landscape. But, you know, we live in a media world, so who's to say, you know, what's real, what's constructed? You know, what is, what is seen from nature? Well, first of all, landscape isn't really nature because it's selected. But, you know, what is seen? So this is a straight image that was not interfered with. Just, it's just a strange occurrence. Uh, you know, this is a combination of a Florida landscape and a prehistoric diorama, you know, from a museum. So, so this piece was about, you know, the landscape you're looking at and how there's this duality where it's, it's like two images in one. And, and you don't know whether it's a straight photograph, you know, which this one happens to be, or, or whether it's been constructed. Because you know there are landscapes, there are landscapes in the landscape, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is you know a, a sculpture of a cactus stuck into a cactus. You know, so I had a good time with this, and it, it it's it's pretty overt, but uh, but it is a way of you know I guess a kind of a critique or a, a fun kind of way of looking at traditional landscape and how how we would. You know, you know, in a way, can reconstruct the landscape now or deconstruct the landscape uh, through media. We're in a uh, really enviable position of having you as a uh, a local artist, in a sense. Uh, you've been you've been here for I've been here a long time. Long time, yeah. Uh, and um, you're at a, of course, a, a extraordinarily high um, level for what that. Tends to you know be thought of as you know as a region. Um, I, I wonder you've you've got all these different circles of people in the audience, and I wonder about um, you mentioned the um, the sort of feminist circle that you didn't have at the beginning, and I wonder how that's how that shaped the work um, since you know, as as it developed. I mean, you almost kind of created your 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 own in a way with uh, with VSW Press and other ways of working. Oh, oh yeah, you know it was amazing. I mean, the first time I knew of other women doing printing was when I got a a card catalog from uh, the Women's Printing Center in in LA, and lo and behold, here were the names and addresses and work of you know twenty or thirty women who were printing. So. So the press, you know, being involved with the press was amazing. I mean, it gave uh, the, the workshop, the visual studies workshop, because we were in Rochester, but, you know, it was an international community with people passing through all the time. Uh, the, the workshop did, you know, for, for instance, residencies, and the people who made books, an artist would come for a month and work on a book, and, and Tate carries this on and, and is, is doing this work now. Uh, you know, working with artists from, you know, all over the world. So, uh, you know, this was remarkable. I mean, having, having this community was, uh, you know, a, a very special. Were you, were you consciously choosing, you know, specific women to work with to try to get their narratives um, in, in a way 
told stories that wouldn't be published otherwise, uh, including your own. I mean, essentially, oh, wow. your 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 mother's, my mother's book uh, from '93, and um, the gyne the gynecologist. It was one of those projects that I, I think you mentioned started out as a big research project that was going to be yeah. a, a more of a critical volume, and then it turned into a, a very straightforward, but you know, right. you know, direct, a high, highly direct mm -hmm. piece. Uh, well, I, I don't know, you know, the workshop talked about a little the way we chose. The press was, uh, we, didn't, we didn't really have an editorial board. You know, we sort of, if somebody came to us with a project that we felt we, we could do because we had the technology and could find a way to fund it, uh, we did it. You know, it, it wasn't really, you know, an editorial decision. But of course, after a while, you're making a certain kind of artist book, which isn't, there aren't too many places that are doing that. So people who want to make something like that come to you. So it, it kind of was, uh, you know, it's kind of self-selecting, as you know. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, and, you know, there were occasions where we got a grant and we could put out proposals and, and choose artists. But just as often, it was people uh, happening mm. by. But it, it, you know, it was a privilege to, uh, <laughs> you know, to have that community. And there were people coming through, of course, doing, you know, all kinds of media arts. We had early, you know, early program in video and, uh, and, and of course, photography. You have said in another interview uh, with Jessica McDonald uh, that. If you hadn't been so active in this in the '60s, particularly here, you might have been a, a freedom writer. You might you might have gone down south and done. No, I didn't say if I hadn't been so active. I said if I hadn't had three children. Oh, in the '60s. <laughs> <laughs> I would, for for Elizabeth, David, and Ethan, I was trying to you know, kind of like, you know <laughs> expand that a bit. But there you go. Um, so I, I wonder about uh, activities like the uh, the women's encampment. I wonder, could you go to that to that work? And, and I mean, when you start to build in, um, this this was like one of the more extraordinary projects. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how how this comes to be? What what this is what this is like? Not only from uh, the perspective of you know, having been in the encampment, but then also. What would you inspired you to, to make the work in this in this manner? Okay, so the the women's encampment. This was a, a group of of women got together and either bought or rented a farm uh, that was uh, outside of Seneca Falls, which of course is, is the um, um, the place where the women's rights movement is uh, started. And uh, there's an army base in Seneca Falls, uh, and uh, they found out that there were nuclear weapons being stored on this base, which was scheduled to be shipped to Germany. And this was a secret thing. It, the military did not want it known that they were storing nuclear weapons in upstate New York. And uh, so a group of women got together and either bought or rented this farm and started a small encampment uh, to protest this fact. And. Uh, it was, a, it was a small group, but on weekends, you know, women from Rochester and so forth, you know, myself included, would, would go down there to support. And they had, you know, they, they would protest outside the gates of the encampment. And as you can see in this piece, people would hang, you know, pillowcases with signs and so forth. And, and the women were incredibly maligned, harassed. Uh, army helicopters flew over the encampment at night. The, the locals hated the women. The women were disrupting their lives and their livelihood because the army base was their livelihood. Uh, they, they put 20 flags in their front yard as sort of talismans to, I don't know, scare off these demonic women. And the women were really demonized and, and in the press too. So, so I decided I wanted, I don't, I, don't, I don't usually do a directly didactic piece, although my piece, a lot of my work has overtones, political overtones and so forth. But this one, I really wanted to do some piece that showed the encampment in a different kind of way. So uh, I consider these portraits. And uh, 
So this was this was a you know like I won't go into the process, but there's this, there was this architect's diazo paper, and it was direct positive. So if somebody stood on the paper, it blocked out the light, and you got the footprint. So that's one piece of it. And uh, then there was a portrait of the woman, and then uh, I asked her to write something. So there are, you know, like 15 portraits or so of, of individuals at the encampment, you know, just not terribly scary women. And um, the side panels were more, you know, documents of, of the actions. And uh, I made this piece and I hung it, I think, outside the ladies' room at Sibley's department store <laughs> in a corridor because I wanted, you know, I wanted a lot of people to see it, and, and it, it was really interesting because people stopped and read all of those little notes, and, and I think, you know, it's, the, it's my only piece, really, probably, or one of my few pieces of active propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting to see it, you know, so many years later, and, you know, we're still kind of fighting for women's issues. It seems absurd. Yeah, I would argue that the, um, one of the remarkable things about the exhibition here and the gathering of the work is how prescient it is and how, and how relevant it all is uh, very much still today. Um, I think we got time for questions. There's how are we doing? Uh, so many remarkable, uh, brilliant people in the audience that have worked right. with Joan over the years. I, you know. Thank you. Thanks, Tate. Thanks, Joan. Yes, I think we all agree. We all agree that there's a, a bevy of um, intelligent people here who I'm sure having seen as much of the show that they've seen and, and this great conversation here will have their own questions. So we do have some um, folks in the uh, audience that have microphones. So we will open up the floor to questions now. Um, when you're thinking about uh, printmaking, because you talked a lot about reproduction and different media and mediums, what are you thinking about when you're bringing that into a museum space um, such as MAG that has a lot of other art or like positioning your work among um, like a museum like this and like how you think about that exhibition and like what pieces, like we talked about the women's portrait series, like what are you thinking about? What's the thought process there and like bringing it into this like museum space? Well, you really have to address that to Jess and Alma Dina, who were the curators, and, and I did not have, uh, you know, they were involved in that process rather than me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would be happy to jump in. Actually, as you were speaking, I was thinking about, I was reflecting on our visits to your home and your studio and how really joyful that was to have Joan Lyons open her studio <laughs> to you and, you know, sort of pulling things out uh, for us to see. And uh, each time we visited, it was one kind of treasure after another. And, you know, that's always one of the, um, one of the limitations of working in a museum context is you have the limitations of space and geography and how much you can fit and where you can put it. And um, so there were many things that we did have to omit from our checklist ultimately that were really wonderful and, and, um, and sorely missed as far as I'm concerned. But I think one of the things that we really did want to do was include some of the bigger pieces, really take up space in the galleries with Joan's work because they are impressive. Notes from the backyard, uh, women's encampment, um, the bedspread. I mean, really things that just occupy space. And um, and we were able to do that. And I think it, it really is, um, yeah. you know, I, I enjoyed that process. Yes, this is a pretty similar question, but like as someone who's had your work in a lot of museums and like a lot of really reputable museums, what's the process like as an artist putting your work in a museum? And have you ever like, I don't, like are you ever, do you feel strongly about how it's presented or are you pleased or yeah, displaced yeah, by that's it? That's interesting. I'm probably not the person to ask this. I, I really have not shown my work very much. I mean, I was pretty busy. I mean, I, I was running the, the press. I was raising a family. 
I, I kind of snuck my work into the spare time. And, and through the 70s and 80s, anyhow, I mean, I did my work to survive. You know, I mean, I made work to find out who I was. <laughs> I was trying to, you know, grow up and define myself through it. And so I'd make the work and I'd stick it in the drawers and I call them drawings, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, but I wasn't isolated because I had this wonderful, you know, workshop community. And, and I also showed in a, you know, interesting gallery in Rochester way back in the 60s, you know, Jackie Schumann Gallery. So, you know, so I don't mean I was isolated, but I, I did not have time or a lot of interest in actually getting my work out. And uh, that's one thing. And the, the, the art world was not interested in such hybrid work in those days. You know, the photo people would say it's print and the print people would say it's photo. So, so actually, uh, I would send work out if someone asked me to, you know, send them some work to put in a show. I was very happy to do it and I sent it, but, but I didn't really, you know, actively that was that that act of seeking of exhibitions and and being around in you know the New York gallery scene or the museum world was not really uh, I didn't do much of it. Just to follow up on that a little bit, I wonder if you um, you were adamant that you get a press when when visual studies yeah. started. I mean, adamant and um, you know told the state to help buy that press, which was really, you know, really rare at that yeah. time. They wouldn't buy uh, capital, you know, right. project uh, expenditures like that. So, but you got it, you got, you got the press. Did you see the, um, the book as an alternative space to a lot of what was happening, you know, museum wise? I mean, a lot of people were oh, starting oh, to move yeah, away yeah. from so museums. And, I mean, the seventies was an absolute remarkable time. And I think it's akin to now where technology is just changing to a degree that it, it was transforming everything, uh, you know, for artists and, and you know, and, you know, for, for the world. So at that time, what was new, brand new, you know, the idea of like a copy machine, you know, you could make it, a, you can duplicate something with something other than a mimeograph. Uh, you know, copy machines, uh, uh, camcorders, which were, you know, this size, but it was portable video. Uh, you know, artist spaces were starting, government funding was beginning for the arts, so all of a sudden, you know, there were, there were artist spaces, there were alternatives to museums. Uh, and and we, we, we were very interested in all of these alternative practices for artists, where the artists could take the means of, of not only the production, but presentation of their work into their own hands. And, and artist books were really a part of that. And, you know, we didn't even call them artist books when we, we started. We, I started the press in 1972. And, uh, you know, it just seemed like if you were going to have a photographer, you know, Nathan believed this too. If you were having a photography space, you should be able to print books. <laughs> you know? I mean, we never printed, you know, photo books as such, but, you know, but it was important. So the press sort of slowly evolved, and it did seem important. Because, I mean, books are fabulous. You know, a couple of little books that I made in the 80s and 90s uh, have been seen, you know, far more than any of my other work. They kind of just get out there, you know. Yeah, I think the point out, too, is uh, uh, in the show is the... Um the bra piece uh, that was in the ripoff show, is that right? Yeah. So, it's, so another way of innovating at the very beginning was to send out you know, pads of images for exhibition and people could take yeah. away uh, individual prints as opposed to the sort of, sort of refined or uh, more rarefied notion of like a museum space or a, a gallery. Thank you, Joan. Um, do you still feel this less than um, that you felt in the 80s about intimate things that you see? It was less than, I'm sorry. Um, you talked about fabric as being less than. Oh, and so no, 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 I didn't say that I felt that way. I'm saying that this was, there was a hierarchy, 
you know, there was a hierarchy in yeah. the art world, right? Yeah. It was the men and the abstraction and, you know, the, the decorative arts were down here and, 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 and photography was here and painting was there and, you know, the etching department was here and the lithography department was here in the school. It, it, it was a very siloed yes. time and I don't think things are like that now. I mean, in, in many ways. But did you internalize it? I mean, or were you rebelling against it? What was your... Well, yeah, I was trying to challenge some things. And, and you know, and the biggest challenge for me was, was making some of that pretty, you know, pretty looking work like that prom dress, which is, was, you know, at the time, you know, everything you weren't supposed to do. It was pastel, it was pretty, it was representational, it was feminine, it was, yeah. uh, you know. So, yeah, so that was definitely meant as a kind of... But it was also, you know, so it's okay to have some sentimentality and show it, why not? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So can you elaborate on your relationship to Tennessee? Oh, well, no big rela... I did an artist residency there for a year. In, at, in a little town, Clarksville, Tennessee. And it was a revelation because I had not spent time in the South and, uh, yeah. And it was a month to work, it's great. <laughs> Joan, I wonder if um, I, you mentioned the Schumann Gallery and I wonder if you wouldn't um, show us the bedspread piece and maybe talk a little bit about when that work was originally exhibited because the way that we have it installed now I know is different than how it was first shown. I think of that work as really kind of punk. It's like a very, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, especially with like Rauschenberg and some of the other you know, folks that were coming up through the 60s and yeah. then, and here you have like, you know, s silky, yeah. You know, imagery, <laughs> you know, a flat woman, yeah. you know, yeah. repeated and, and like t taking up, almost like sending up all the pop yeah. stuff that was happening. Did, were you, was that in your consciousness at all when you were doing that? <laughs> well, or? you know, Jessica McDonald has been going through the work in my studio all week and she's pulling out like all these prints from the 60s, which are, you know, a little embarrassing. I have all these day glow prints with, you know, big dots and spots and silhouettes and so... <laughs> So, you know, I had been, you know, doing, you know, some of that, but, but this was a very different I idea. Yeah, it is big and it's in your face and it's, you know, it's tongue in cheek. It's, yeah. it's, it's more, it's more kind of entertaining than angry. Uh, <laughs> so, so it's this, you know, this giant woman embedded in the bed. <laughs> so it, it's that kind of, you know, punny kind of takeoff. So, uh, and, and it's on, you know, pink silk, and it's very crude silk screen, which I like. I wouldn't have liked this if it was really realistic, but it's, you know, okay, so it's in part uh, crude silk screen, because that's all I could do at the time. I probably washed out these silk screens in my bathtub, and I didn't have any, you know, sophisticated, uh, you know, photo equipment or anything at the time. but. Uh, but I did show this piece at the Schumann Gallery in 1969. Jackie Schumann was a remarkable woman who started a gallery in Rochester and thought she would form an art market and was incredibly uh, supportive of people who exhibited in her gallery. And I didn't realize at the time how extraordinary this was. She would say, would you like to have a show in April? And I'd say, sure. And so April 1st, I'd walk in with a bunch of paintings that she had never seen and stick them up on the wall. And, and, you know, so anyhow. So this piece I exhibited by putting a bed in the gallery. So there, it was a bedspread and there were pillowcases and there was a sheet with the same image in black and white behind it and a roll of paper towels. You know, I was doing this kind of whole environment, uh, which was a very 60s thing to do. <laughs> but pretty radical for Rochester in 69. Right? I mean, to be showing this work in Rochester in 69. Oh, we've got a question in the back. Joan and Tate, this has been fabulous. Thank you. But Joan, I want to know more about the women's encampment piece that you installed next to the Sibley's. I'm sorry. I want to know about your installation of the women's encampment piece in front of the Sibley's bathroom. How did you do that? And what was that about? Did I understand you correctly when you mentioned it? Yeah. Yeah, well, well, I wanted to, I wanted to show it 
someplace where it would get a lot of traffic, you know. Was it was it <laughs> was it a guerrilla style or did was no, it no, like no, no, I had you had approval? And yeah. I don't quite remember. I don't quite remember how I got permission to show it there. If there was some, you know, I I don't remember the details, but I do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was so, it's not in the bathroom, it was Carter. That was, yeah. Well, Sibley's show work, right? That time? Oh. Yeah. Well, this wasn't a gallery, no. you know, but they did, yeah, they, they were a, what, kind of an interesting community uh, organization. Yes. Yeah, did they show work? Yeah. Yeah, they did. I think they did. Yes. Yes. I think we've got a question here. Hi, Joan. <laughs> uh, I wanted to um, just say a word about not only your work, but how you influenced all of us around you, especially your students, and how you and Nathan both operated. Uh, you remember that we didn't have we didn't have phones back then. We had a phone tree. Yeah. <laughs> that we used to communicate to one another. And the phone tree message came out uh, that, that afternoon that we would, uh, the women were to gather at your house uh, on Rutgers Street and that we would come. And of course we all showed up. And what I remember from that evening is, uh, it was 1972 and uh, you sat us all down and you said, now is the time for the world to hear the voice of women and young women. And um, maybe <laughs> this is how I remember it. And, <laughs> wow. and this is your job uh, to come forward and to speak. Uh, and it's something I've never forgotten. So thank you. Wow, that's <laughs> Yeah, I don't remember that I would have. <laughs> well, thank you. I think um, it is about 3.05, and this has been a fabulous program. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Tate. Thank you, Joan.